you all are here and have come back on a weeknight and very, very grateful that um, we had that healing time, all right, because uh, that's why we're here. Um, we are here to be made whole as individuals and as a community, as a body. Last night, our focus was on bringing God's rest to an unsettled world. Now, when a phone goes off, that means that y'all are supposed to really hear what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's God's way of emphasizing what the speaker is saying. Got it? Um, and so we talked about um, going down to the ocean depths of happy rest. That when each of us every day gives ourselves a luxurious gift of stillness, then we can go and understand that we are made of love, by love, and for love. That is the unity in every human being. Please hear the word every human being. All, A-L-L. -L. That is so important to keep in mind when we have forces that are trying to divide us. Division and polarization and tribalism is the opposite of oneness, of healing and wholeness. Do you understand the difference? It is polar opposites. God is moving in us just as we were gathered here for healing. God is moving in us for wholeness and oneness and healing. So last night, we were talking about bringing God's rest to an unsettled world. Tonight, we are talking about faith and responsibility in a diverse world. In other words, to bring God's oneness to a world that's divided. So, we're going to be talking about healing all night long, wholeness all night long, oneness all night long. Dr. King, let me remind you, said that the way the universe is made is that we live in a network of mutuality, he called it. And it is such that I cannot be who I am called to be unless you are who you're called to be. And you cannot be who you're called to be unless I am who I am called to be. That is just the way God put it together, he said, on the last Sunday of his life in the pulpit of the National Cathedral. So, we live in a world now where all of the Political science experts are telling us that we've moved our politics from an architecture of adversarial opponents, which can be a very good thing, to tribalistic seeing one another as enemies. And we who are gathered in this room, everybody who follows Jesus, the name of Jesus, the Christ, the mind of Christ, are called to experience oneness and proclaim, I am not my primary identity. I may vote one party or another, but my primary identity, my primary identity is to be a third way moving forward. So I want to unpack that a little bit tonight and I want to um, actually have a little class and we'll have a little handout and we're going to work through the handout and um, we're going to have some skill building and then we're going to wrap up the revival. But not now, not, not yet ladies, because I want to set this thing up, set it up. I do not want to be in denial in the church house about the fact that we 
are in a tough atmosphere. David Brooks, New York Times columnist this past week, said we live in an atmosphere of intimidation and fear, and it is unquestionably real and will keep growing. We all are called to step into that atmosphere of fear and do the opposite. Now, the Bible says that the opposite of fear is love. Perfect love casts out fear. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. They are two very different force fields. You live in the house of love. You feel live in the house of fear. Jesus, according to Henry Nouwen, can be understood by the fact that he never, ever allowed himself to be seduced out of the house of love. Even when his detractors came and asked him questions from the house of fear, all of his answers were always from the house of love. You and I are called to join Jesus' third way of always responding from the house of love. Now, that means that we're going to have to continue to focus and proclaim by word and deed, mouth and action, body, spirit, this allness, this everyoneness. I have an example that came to me today from the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Bishop Curry, in the face of the atmosphere of intimidation and fear, felt compelled that he had to be this specific about the inclusiveness, the oneness of our call. We maintain our long-standing commitment to support and welcome, and we're just going to name these off. Refugees and immigrants. And to stand with those who live in our midst without documentation. We affirm that like all people, Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons are entitled to full civil rights and protection under the law. We affirm and renew the principles of inclusion and the protection of civil rights of all persons with disabilities. We commit to the honor and dignity of women and speak out against sexual or gender-based violence. We express solidarity with and honor the indigenous peoples of the world. We affirm the right to freedom of religious expression and vibrant presence of different religious communities, especially our Muslim sisters and brothers. And we acknowledge our responsibility in stewardship of creation and all that God has given into our hands. We do so because God is the creator. We are all God's children, created equally in God's image. And if we are God's children, we are all brothers and sisters. Eight different things. Eight is the biblical symbol of completion. Baptismal fonts are octagonally shaped because we baptize people into completion, into wholeness, oneness the synonym for healing. We are here to talk about our healing as individuals, yes. And we are here to talk about our healing as a nation and as a globe. May I have an amen? Amen. Now, I have written a book called Eight Habits of Love. And I'm going to give you a little tutorial in this book. Tim Heflin, like Oprah Winfrey, has arranged for a free gift for absolutely everybody in this room. It's taped underneath your pew. All you have to do is reach under there, reach under your pew, and pull out your fist. <laughs> free, free of charge. That is the size of your brain about. And I'm going to give you a little tour through your brain and tell you how love and fear works in your brain, how they work in your brain. <coughs> Dr. Paul McLean, great neurologist, 
said that we have three brains, actually. The oldest, oldest, oldest brain is the brain that's down here in the brain stem. And we have that in common with all reptiles. It's a great thing that we have this brain because it doesn't think. It reacts. So when something that really threatens us comes in, we don't have to stop and think. All we have to do is react to decide whether to flee or fight. That's what reptiles do. Bam. You've got it. No thinking. Reactivity only. Then we have a younger brain on top of the reptilian brain where we are not only in brotherhood and sisterhood with lizards and snakes, but here, the mammalian brain, we are kin to all mammals. And mammals are distinguished from reptiles because mammals can care for their young, have compassion, and have feelings, and actually thoughts. We have an even younger brain, which is the prefrontal cortex here, where our knuckles are. And that we have in common with all the other primates. And that's where we can calculate, innovate, and create. That's where Brother Einstein was working. Brother Hitler was working down here. When you and I get afraid, all the blood flow goes down to our reptilian brain and we are unable to act like mammals or primates. We don't think, we just react. The job that we have if we want to have the mind of Christ, the mind of a mammal, the mind of a brilliant human being is to let the love blood flow up into our younger brains so that we can create solutions to our divisive problems. Now, you and I are called, I'm about to finish the, uh, the tutorial on my book, okay? Just to let you know where I am in my sermon. You and I are called to be aware of when our fears have made us reptilian where we're not thinking, where we're just reacting. We are called to exercise our ability to self-reflect or be mindful so that we can sort out what fears are real and what fears are imaginary. If somebody introduced a garden snake into this aisle right here, I would immediately flee. I am so scared of snakes. But a, a serpentologist, is that what they're called? Somebody who studies snakes, you say, Ed, that is not a rattlesnake, it's not a copper snake, it's not a coral snake. It's absolutely not threatening your life. This is a sweet little old garden snake. Calm down. Let the blood flow again back to your mammalian and primatial brains. We are called to sit every day, I think, whatever sitting means for you. It may be swimming, gardening, playing marbles. I don't know what it is, but something you can stare into space and think about yourself. See yourself. Get an observation deck on yourself Ask yourself whether your fears are imaginary or real. And also ask this question. Do I have my fears or have I become my fears? Now that's a big one. If you want to be a responsible human being, I'm talking about every time I talk about something like a responsible human being, just hear me think and say, the mind of Christ. If you want to have the mind of Christ, stop and think, do I have fears that come and go or have I become my fears? Now you can feel somebody who's become their fears. 
You come into their force field and you feel fearful too. You have to do a job, a mental job on yourself to calm yourself down. You and I, as a part of this third force of love, not one tribe versus another tribe, but a third force of love are called to the responsibility, the healing, the wholeness of making sure that we're always staying up here. I think there are eight habits you could cultivate to do that. The first one I've already named, it is stillness. All you have to do is give yourself some time for the silty water in your basin to calm down and for the silt to fall to the bottom and the water to be clear at the top. Or to give yourself time to understand that the choppiness of your life is on the surface of the ocean and if you can go down to the ocean depths, you will find happy rest as we sing in joyful, joyful, we adore thee. A second habit in addition to stillness is generosity. That means that you don't hold on to what is flowing into your life. You don't become stagnant. You don't become the Dead Sea that only receives the Jordan River but doesn't give out anything. The Sea of Galilee is alive and vibrant because it receives the Jordan River from the northern banks and then lets the Jordan River flow out the southern banks. We're called to be people of compassion. When you exercise the habit of compassion, then what you're looking for is the loveliness in every human being, the Christ in every human being. You want to find a way to help that person discover his or her loveliness again. The fourth habit of love is forgiveness. If you hold on to a grudge, it's like you're taking poison and expecting the other person who hurt your feelings to get sick. Because grudge holding is poison, it is toxin, and unless we forgive, we are going to make ourselves sick and kill ourselves. There's a wonderful fifth habit of love called play. Have you ever been fishing and your line was so tight you couldn't feel what was on the other end below the surface. But if you let there be a little play in your line, then you could feel whether or not you got a fish on the other end of the line. Have you ever seen people who are so uptight, they don't even know what's going on beneath the surface of their lives? We are called to be playful. There's another one called community. The sixth habit of love where we understand that we cannot be a human being alone, we cannot be a Christian alone, we cannot be healed alone, we cannot be a good person alone, we need other people. As Desmond Tutu says, a person is a person through other persons. That's what the Zulu word Ubuntu means. Then um, the seventh has to do with candor. Candor has to do with being able to say to somebody else, this is how I feel when you do X, Y, and Z. It's not judgment. It's not tearing somebody down. It's simply distinguishing between their being and their doing and your being and your doing. You know, St. Frank Sinatra who said, everybody's made up of dooby dooby doo. You're doing... I'm having difficulty with, but it's not your being. And finally, truth. Truth that leads us into a deeper understanding, a broader understanding of life. Now, my experience is that if you and I can exercise those eight habits of love, that we can get out of our reptilian brain and come out and be the mind of Christ and make a contribution to the healing, not only of ourselves, but to one another and to the world. Now, I want to say that this um, creativity and innovation that is available to us in our prefrontal lobes, we can 
with the mind of Christ operating there, we can heal the problems we have. And uh, it takes some skill building and it takes some coalition building. A very good example came in the news today. Did you know that today it was announced a new coalition of Muslims and Jews to work together in the United States of America to put down every instance of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Do you know my friend Ann right here, last night put on Facebook a live experience of our being here last night and my wife, sick in bed in Birmingham, Alabama, was listening to the story I told about her Jeep and that she hadn't cleaned it out in 19 years. <laughs> Before we left this room last night, she had introduced her opinion about the impact of what I had said on her. And she didn't use all church language either. Now, what I want you to have <coughs> are some skills about how you can actually be loving in a relationship with someone who is very, very, very different from you. All of us are one, but all of us are different. And God, I think, in creating us differently, wanted us to acknowledge those differences and appreciate those differences and celebrate those differences. All of us are different in terms of gender, in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of skin color, in terms of experience. And the fact of the matter is, if we want to have a successful grouping of relationships, we need some guidelines about how to respect one another. So if you'll turn to the guidelines side of this, this comes from an organization called Visions Incorporated, established by Dr. Valerie Batts, the first African-American student at Duke University. She did her PhD in racism, and she's been my teacher for 50, more than 15 years. And she says that here are some guidelines that really help people stay out of their division and help them have a third way of love. And I'm going to name them all, but I'm going to bear down on one or two. Number one is you can actually be in a conversation and somebody has a difference of opinion and you don't have to immediately judge it and you don't have to spend your time while they're forming their opinion and telling you what their opinion is, you're forming your response. No, you can listen and simply try it on like you're trying on a piece of clothing at the store and decide not to wear it. You say, let me think about it, let me try it on. That's not the one I wanna bear down on. <laughs> Number two, it is okay to disagree. That's the great thing about the candor habit of love is it is absolutely all right to disagree and not to have a relationship conditioned on total always, dis, uh, always agreeing with somebody. In meetings, in relationships, in intimate marriages, in anything, it's okay to disagree. Here's one of the most important. It is not okay to blame, shame, and attack yourself or anybody else, ever. Now let me tell you, there are a whole bunch of religions that are fear-based religions. There are a whole bunch of ideologies that are fear-based ideologies. And in there, there is some form of blame, shame, and attack. And behind that is some kind of distorted notion of God that God is punitive. That God is interested in blaming, shaming, and attacking us. The Bible, the best of the Bible tells us, no, you know what God is full of? Mercy, forgiveness, steadfast forgiveness and love. It is not, God is not interested in your blaming, shaming, and attacking yourself. And God is sure not wanting you to blame, shame, and attack somebody else. I could go on and have a revival about that. <laughs> Number four is I take 100% responsibility for your feelings. That's the sign of maturity, not blaming it on somebody else. And if you need to speak up, 
if you're hurting, if you've got an ouch because of something somebody else said, use candor and say, may I simply say that when you called me a so-and-so or referred to other stereotypical people, I had an ouch and I simply need to register that. Note both process and content. There's content going on in this room right now, but there's also a process. And I'm trying to read your body language and your facial expressions to see what kind of process is going on there and try to be as sensitive as I can in the confines of our being here. Practice self-focus. Please, please, please always be trying to build that observation deck on yourself to say, am I acting like a reptile right now? Am I reactive? Am I not thinking? Or am I, can I be playful here? And that's the mammalian's brain, being playful, caring for the young, being compassionate. Am I feeling for somebody else? I was standing here while we were praying for the healing. You came down here, sister. You were, and all of a sudden, I began to feel not only all the problems that I need to have healed, but all these other people. And I started praying for the healing of the community. In my morning prayer, there's the first signal I have that I'm actually going into stillness is that my facial muscles begin to relax. My lip muscles begin to relax. And then I begin, oof, something's about to go on. And then the next step in my stillness, I'm going down below the surface, the choppy surfaces of my ocean. And the next one is I begin to pray for other people. And then the next one is I begin to feel like I'm sitting in a pool of balm instead of anger. And then the last one is I start to pray for my enemies. Oh, my Lord. One time <coughs> we had this guy from England, and he loved Greek dances. And there were about 100 of us. And we were in a circle. And he was teaching us this Simplest steps. And we did that, and we kept going around gradually around the entire social hall, 150 of us, like Greek dancers. And then he said, now, I want you to bring into the circle. You can close your eyes now. You're not running all over one another. We did that. We bumped into one another for a little bit. But then he says, bring into the circle all the people who right now need healing. Then, I said, okay. Bring into the circle all the people in the world, do you think, who are in harm's way? Then he said, uh, now, bring into the circle all the people you would rather not have in the circle. Whoa. That's the test of whether or not you have touched the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ is working in you. Do you love and pray for your enemies? That's the test of whether or not you and I are part of the third force that can heal this world. So practice self-focus. Ask questions of yourself and others. Maintain confidentiality. And uh, then um, uh, practice both and thinking. Watch out for the butts. Uh, it's either my way or your way. And this version doesn't have the one that I really wanted to talk about. <laughs> it is this. Pay attention to intent and impact. You can intend the greatest thing in the world and it have a very harmful impact based on another person's social location. So turn and flip to the other side. Life does have oppression in it. And here's a list of oppressions on the left-hand side. One is racism. 
And there are non-target groups, in other words, people who are historically advantaged when it comes to this issue, white people. And there are target groups or people who are historically disadvantaged, people of color. When a white person with great intent <coughs> says something that is stereotypical or, or otherwise abusive, you don't know what really has happened until a person of color speaks up or a white person asks a people, person of color to speak up and say, what was the impact of that on you? That goes all the way through the list. Sexism. Men are historically advantaged. Women are historically disadvantaged. Men don't know what they've done until they ask a woman, what was the impact of that on you? Classism. Middle and upper class people are historically advantaged. Poor and working class people are target groups or historically disadvantaged. We don't know what has happened in the transaction until we ask what was the impact on you. You can go on in terms of elitism and education, in terms of religion, militarism, military status. There are certain veterans that are historically advantaged and certain veterans that are not. Age, elders, 40 people and over are target groups. Heterosexism, heterosexuals are the historically advantaged people, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people are historically disadvantaged. You don't know about the transaction until you ask about the impact, on and on and on. So we've got to wrap this up. God is forming a new order. Behold, I am making all things new. The old is passing away. Behold, the new is coming. Are you going to be a part of the new? Or are you going to be a part of the old? Are you going to be a part of the divisiveness? Or are you going to part, be a part of the oneness? It takes intent. It takes prayer. It also takes skill. And asking people about some feedback. And it will not change if you and I stay in groups, segregated, the way we look. It is so very important if you are a Hillary Clinton voter for you to find a friend who's a Trump voter and talk it through what happened. If you're a Trump voter for you to find a Hillary voter and say, can you tell me the story about why you voted the way you voted? Ask stories. It's when we share narratives that we become human with one another. Then, it is very important, I'm so inspired by this church, it's so important for you to have friends who are in a different social location than you are on this chart. Find yourself in all of that and make sure that you are developing a relationship, if you're a Christian, to make sure that you are having a real, durable, candor-filled relationship with someone who's Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or atheist and say, can we talk about what life means to you? Tim Heflin says that y'all have got Muslims praying in here on Friday. Praise be to Jesus for that. He's got me going to talk tomorrow night to a bunch of Turkish Muslims about my walk with Islam and fasting during Ramadan and hearing from an imam the two nights after 9-11 that to be religious in the 21st century is to be interreligious. And all of a sudden I began reading the Bible in an interreligious way. You know the Bible is not a Western document. We have to read it from an interreligious way. We have to look at Jesus from an interreligious way. Look at all the times that Jesus told stories about Samaritans. Not his religion. God does not belong to any religion. God is not a Christian.
God is not a Muslim. We have to get into that. Now, I've got to wrap all this up. You can't do this all the time. You have to give yourself a break from time to time. You have to have some time out. And you can't do it perfectly. There was a beautiful, beautiful op-ed piece today by Leon Wiesenthaler, I mispronounced that, about Leonard Cohen. And he said, Leonard Cohen's credo was the beauty of imperfection. He's known mostly for that wonderful phrase in his beautiful song anthem, ring the bells that still can ring. Um, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Leonard Cohen said, you know, it's sad when somebody thinks they've reached perfection because what they're trying to do is keep the light from coming in. If you aren't aware of your brokenness, how are you going to need, know your need for God? Fix the crack, lose the light. Now, I hope that you felt the love of God inside you when I talked about the beauty of imperfection. Because God made us with a God-shaped hole in us. We need God to fill the God-shaped hole. You can try all sorts of other things. You can try fear. You can try judgmentalism. You can try divisiveness. You can try tribalism. You can try anything, try making billions and billions of dollars, but none of it fills the God-shaped hole. You have to have God to fill the God-shaped hole. I said last night that when I read Henry Nouwen, I began to, every time I saw the word God, substitute the word love to see if it worked. It works. Every time I saw the word Satan in the Bible or the devil, I put in the word fear. It works. Jesus, for 40 days and 40 nights, fasted alone in the desert with the devil or fear, which made him feel awfully insecure. And he said, I'm going to live a love-based life. Now, my brothers and sisters in this choir, this lovely choir, this genius in choir, and my, my brother Andre, who is one of the most genius people in the world on the piano, have agreed for us to sing together a hymn out of the Lift Every Voice and Sing hymn, page 157. This hymn has been sung at every revival I have ever been to. I've been to 5,478 million revivals because my father was a Baptist preacher. And we would sing, revive us again. 157. And please understand that on that verse that says revive us again, what does it say? Fill our hearts with thy love. May our souls be rekindled with fire from above. That's what we are going to end this revival on, my friends. We are wanting not to be in this tribe versus another tribe. We want to be in God's tribe that looks at everybody and loves them. So let's sing 157, then we're going to do one more thing, and we're going to bring this thing to a close. stand if you can. Four, please.
One more thing. Have a seat. Now, Tim Heflin said on this next move, I might um, bring up some uh, tough memories for some people. But we're going to do it anyway because we are in the house of love, not the house of fear. In all the good revivals I've ever been to, it was a time for commitment at the end of it. And uh, in some places, it was about coming down front and giving your life to Jesus. In a Methodist revival one week, I gave my life to Jesus five different times. <laughs> but we did it to singing hymn 137, Just As I Am. Now, I'm not asking you to come down front, but Brother Andre is going to play and if anybody wants to sing along, fine. But what I ask of you is this. I want you to make a commitment tonight. You don't have to walk down the aisle and make your commitment to Jesus. Do it right where you are. But ask Jesus to tell you what God wants you to do about healing this country, healing this world and bringing justice for all to our nation. And Andre's going to sing, play it two or three times. I don't know if anybody's going to sing. Okay, we're just going to play. And I trust y'all to let God work in you about what your commitment is tonight. stand at this microphone together. We got to sing verses 5 and 6. every barrier down and you want to use us as your third force in this world to reconcile to make whole to heal we recall earlier in this service that we are all a blessing 
We have all been blessed. And you've told us in the Bible that you have blessed us in order that we might be a blessing. So send us out into the world now to be instruments of your love, to heal, to make whole, and to bless all these things we pray in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of love. And let all the people say, Amen. Thank you all. Yeah. Good.